This is the OGM call for Thursday, April 11th, 2024. Uh, we alternate between topic-oriented calls and check-in calls. Last week was a check-in. This week, we have a topic. Uh, and our topic starts with the situation in Gaza and kind of goes into um, trauma as trauma as experience, trauma as it influences, trauma in general. And I'm curious actually how um, uh, how the topic might resonate for you all and if you have strong feelings about where we should go. Um, and actually, um, Patty, if you'd like to jump in and say anything about expectations or desires for the call, um, please do so. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Um, I don't know that I have any of either. Um... Just happy that we're talking about it and looking forward to seeing where we take it. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And um, lest we skirt around it, uh, I think a piece of, of the origin of your message to us was also, hey, there seems to be um, a censorship or a gingerness or something, a chilling effect around support for Palestinians uh, in this mess. And what's up with that? And uh, how does that work? And I, I think that causes traumas and is bouncing around the room as well. Um, so I'm interested in, in our perspectives on all those things. And uh, just before the call, Gil shared a Friedman column, uh, which ran yesterday or the day before, about what the, what the problem is and what the solutions might be. And uh, he was pretty straightforward about um, what he recommended. So that was an interesting, perhaps, starting point. But other alternative solutions uh, uh, for the situation or for trauma would be great to have. I, I do have, um, I have collected a bunch of trauma-informed blank uh, categories, uh, trauma-informed care. I'll, I will sort of look up and share what the different subcategories are, but that's been a thing now for, uh, I think, the better part of a decade, that, that awareness of trauma has been working its way into the population in general, and the, the redesign of systems uh, whether it's, I think policing also falls under this and others uh, with some some awareness of, of trauma and its effects, uh, which I think is a good thing. And then every now and then I read about ways that we overstep and, and do strange things. Uh, la last thing I'll sort of add into the, the this funny start to our conversation is in Portland, famously Measure 110 legalized drugs three years ago. Uh, Portland failed, uh, Oregon failed to put in place most of the of the support services that are required to make this actually work. But also, and in, in reading through and digging deeper into the issue, it turns out that Portland uh, put in place a whole bunch of policies that made it very hands off for dealing with anybody who was on the street doing fentanyl or doing whatever. And you you sort of couldn't do a thing except sit and watch. Um, and I I'm, I'm, I think I'm exaggerating there, but but there was this desire to avoid increasing the trauma by institutionalizing people who needed institutionalizing and doing other sorts of things that made it really hard to actually deal with the situation on the ground. And I, I think a lot of that was policies crisscrossing and in conflict around how to handle people uh, in very difficult situations without increasing their trauma or mm. difficulties. And I and I, again, I'm an amateur and an outsider looking in on the situation, but I was kind of surprised by the kinds of policies that, that appear to be in place here in Oregon. Um, so with that, I'll go to um, the people who would like to step into the conversation. So Gil, then Mike, please. Just very briefly a question on process. If we're going to focus on trauma and you've, I mean, you, what, you, what you've just said illustrated about how that can't be talked about in the abstract, right? It has to be tied to specifics. I'm concerned that if we start with talking about Gaza, uh, we never get out of that and never get to the conversation about trauma more broadly. Um, I would not, just, just a question. Yeah, exactly. And and I have a bit of a concern about that, but I'm not that concerned about it. And I don't want to shortchange the Gaza topic here. So can we sort of gingerly go in? And at some point, if we've over Gaza, uh, we can sort of collectively raise our hands or just pop up and say, hey, um, can we go broader? Is that okay? And I'm, I'm happy to help steer that as well. But that was partly, Gil, why, it, why when I worded the invite, I said, let's not make this call entirely about the Gaza situation, but let's let's go broad. Mm -hmm. 
Um, um, any reaction from people to that? It just seems like. Yes, no? no. Good. Yes. Sounds okay. great. Thanks. Um, Mike. Um, I was going to ask a similar question, and I, I do think it's helpful to kind of define the scope. Um, when I first saw the topic, I thought the assumption, my assumption was this was going to be more on personal trauma, individual stories. Uh, and I, I did want to share something that Lizzie told me. She was recently trained in how to use these anti-opioid drugs. And uh, they, they do cause a major amount of trauma for the people who are injected with them, although dying is much worse. But the, the, the shock of suddenly not being high and, and the physical reaction the body has to the drugs is in, 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 in some ways uh, maybe a good thing because after going through that, um, people probably are discouraged from going on opioids and, you know, shooting up or, or, you know, taking some of these, uh, these, these illicit street drugs. Um, it, it, according to her, it, it was described to her as sort of coming out of anesthesia in, 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 in 90 seconds, <laughs> you know, you're just suddenly just boom and you're in pain and your you know, your brain is just completely um, discombobulated. But I, 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 I just, put that down as a marker about you know personal individual case study of trauma. I, I do think it would be more helpful to look at uh, the impact of trauma broadly on societies. And in order to avoid, you know, going 17 different ways on Gaza, I would propose that we, we start by looking at three or four case studies and the, the trauma that, Iraq has been through, that Syria has been through, um, and and we just celebrate, not didn't celebrate, but we just mark the anniversary of the Rwanda genocides. And they're still struggling with the trauma that that caused. But I, I, I do think it would be helpful to kind of just not focus so narrowly on, on the one case study in front of us now uh, and, and to compare and contrast. Uh, there's been a lot of comparing uh, to uh, what the U.S. did in, in Mosul uh, and in terms of the, the body count and the, the ratio of civilians to uh, ISIS members who were killed. Uh, the big difference, of course, in Mosul was that all the civilians could get the hell out of there and uh, the U.S. military and its allies could fight uh, ISIS in a in a less complicated battlefield. But I I, I, I do worry, I, I particularly worry about Iraq. I mean, it, it's gone, first it was attacked by Iran, you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed, and then it went through, um, you know, two, two horrific wars because there was a madman in charge. And I mean, the madman caused trauma before he was attacked by outside forces. So I, 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 I just, I've not seen many countries figure out how to deal with the kind of widespread trauma that um, these wars have, have generated. Rwanda being probably the one that's been most successful. South Africa, you know, again, it wasn't, it wasn't a full-fledged war, but, you know, they've done truth and reconciliation. But all the psychiatrists I've read about, I've read, you know, they, they, describe countries that are literally in a state of PTSD. It's not not five percent of the population. It's so many people just distressful, paranoid, not sleeping well for years. Um, and I think an important piece here I'd like to add in as well as healing from trauma. And there's a lot of uh, that could it be its own call easily, but between Gabor Mate and uh, 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 Vander, uh, Bessel van der Kolk and a bunch of other people, there's just a, a whole lot of wisdom growing up. Um, uh, and I'll point out that uh, Israel-Palestine is one of many, many cases, and Rwanda and others, of intergenerational trauma. Uh, and and well, uh, the, the kind of cold, hard way of looking at that is the, the he said, she said story of these people's histories and conflicts over time, and who has the upper hand of having suffered more or been displaced more, but then there's the psychological human side of it that's all about how these things actually live 
and ruin lives through generations because of uh, unaddressed uh, crap that happened. And and just yesterday, I found myself in a conversation saying, "Why are people so shitty to each other so often? Why 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 do we do this just so often?" Um, Stuart then Klaus, and uh, feel free to take a beat before stepping into the conversation so we can pace ourselves going in. Can Stuart, I just suggest, Stuart, you're muted. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm trying to suggest that that at some point we contemplate a sort of uh, antithetical to the trauma thing in terms of all of the mechanisms of coping with trauma and the conditioning that people could be taught from childhood on how to mm -hmm. respond to stress so that we're building a more positive society. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Stuart. So I've got a number of um, tidbits um, and I hope as, as a whole they make some some degree of sense or maybe not. Um, one of the things that I've been saying anytime I get the chance when I'm, I'm speaking publicly um, and in, in some ways it, it, it goes to your question, Jerry, about why can't we all be nicer to each other slash why can't we all get along? We're living in a PTSD world, period, end of story. Just read the papers every day. I mean, we are living in a PTSD world, right? Um, I had the opportunity about three three years ago, many of you know, um, Kim Wright was one of the founders of Society 2045. Um, I stewarded a book of hers through the American Bar Association publishing process called Trauma-Informed Lawyering. Um, and it kind of makes sense because, you know, um, very often when people see lawyers, it's they're in some kind of a traumatic situation. So I learned a, a bunch about that. Um, when my wife died, um, I realized it was a traumatic event. And so I read a lot of the work of Peter Levine, who 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 talks about, um, you know, trauma lives in the viscera. It lives in the body. Um, so I, I chose a therapist who also did body stuff. And after about a half a dozen sessions with his massage table sitting on the side, I said, I said, Dan, aren't we ever going to do that? And he looked at me, he said, no, I'm too old for that. I don't do that anymore, which I thought was kind of, kind of funny. Um, I, I read a piece in the media this morning of a journalist reporting from Kiev about how he longs for a decent night's sleep. And then he just, just as he's about to fall asleep, you know, he hears the sirens and he hears the, the missiles and he hears the incoming, you know, Russian assault. Um, I think about, um, you know, the great words of Gandhi if we keep on living, you know, with, a, with an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we're going to end up blind and toothless. And um, it's true. And it, just to touch on, um, you know, Israel-Palestine right now, um, this is just going to, over the long term, um, create more hostility, more animosity, uh, more let's get back at them. That's my, that's my sense of the, the, the end result. This is not going to end the horror. This is just going to increase the horror. And um, the last thing that I want to say is, um, and it's a word of caution, I think. Um, whatever the particular trauma an individual sometimes um, um, goes through, um, one of the challenges is not to make that your primary identity. Um, because you can just perpetuate the trauma and you can also um, stay in it when it's long kind of overdue to step beyond it and to just let go of it. Um, and that I think is all I want to say right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stuart. Boss, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was listening in yesterday to uh, 
the German chancellor into the debates in Germany, uh, because Germany just got accused of aiding and abetting Israelis uh, actions. Uh, and uh, my God, that was a curveball. Um, and so, you know, I was born in 1949 and, and uh, uh, I spent you know, quite a few years uh, in the uh, investment. I started to become more aware and conscious of uh, uh, being conscious about the trauma that Germany had caused, uh, and and uh, uh, and and dealing with with parents that were com completely traumatized, uh, never really that that generation never really got uh, uh, through their their um, what what happened to them there, and then when you look back over you know my lifetime, um, it, it's just it just doesn't stop. Right. I mean, we are supposedly more enlightened and supposedly more advanced, but we're really not. I mean, we have the same cruelty and and uh, passions and and uh, brutality that uh, you can see two thousand years ago. Yeah, uh, there had nothing. Nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed are the tools we 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 have and we're using. And uh, so so then next this no. Couple of days from now, I'm going to go visit my daughter in Nashville, and she's of course deeply embedded in this uh, Israeli Jewish community. There, um, we have been strenuously avoiding uh, any conversation about any of this. But uh, um, you know, what kind of experience is this for? I mean, he has and, uh, my my son-in-law still has his brother, his uncle, his mom living in Israel. So, what kind of uh, um, what kind of uh, uh, thought world you know is he living in, um, and and how do you process uh, all this stuff? So it's, I, I mean, it's just astonishingly um, uh, uh, hopeless, almost. You know how. We seem to be incapable of preventing people of violence and and ruthlessness to reach positions of power where uh, they uh, uh, determine the direction of society. Uh, we can see it right now here in in the U.S. I mean, imagine it's not Trump; it's the people around Trump, you know, who want to come into office and and gain power. And we would be in the same mess here. You know, we could we could be getting into a really bad space. Uh, that that most Americans can't even process uh, now, and so um, I think there is there is something. I mean, we talked about the dawn of everything, right? So to to look at uh, at humanity, our species in total, in totality, um, and the the conclusion you come to is that's just us. That's just you know that's just our species, and the only way we can change that is to package ourselves into a set of rules and norms and uh, and understanding where peace has a chance. You know, the the um, my my big takeaway from when I when I was taking a deep dive into Christianity and 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 uh, and religion is that the the guiding message of the New Testament is um, that you have to love your neighbor you know, and and that you have to. Uh, take care of your poor because the poor will always be with you. And if you don't take care of them, you now you're going to end up in a mess. Um, so, so the, the, we have learned nothing. Right? I mean, we, we, we have uh, gone, we're going through the same cycles round and round it goes, you know, and now that we uh, have a world that's so populated and we have weapons that are so powerful, um, it just gets worse. Uh, and and so we and then on top of it we're dealing with all the environmental issues and everything that's around it. This is a crazy time. You know? um, this this could I mean think about the billions and billions of dollars and assets and technology and so on that gets wasted in wartime. I mean we we our best and brightest minds are trying to figure out how to kill the other guy more efficiently instead of how can we restore our soil. And, and preserve our waters, right? So, God, you just want to cry, you know? Um, to 
put a tiny positive note on this. Uh, the conversation is making me think of questions like, how might we act to disarm trauma causing agents? And to sort of focus on the, the problems that matter together. And I, I don't know the answer, but but um, I'm, re I'm really interested in behavior that can easily spread, contagious behaviors that lead people to, to just stop the crap. And I and I, I think that's a combination of things, uh, maybe more things than anybody can grasp or do at one time. But I'm I'm really interested in positive solutions to this um, to this issue. Um, Mike, then Patty, then Kevin. I'm going to throw out a couple more case studies and some possible steps forward. Um, most of you know that my wife was a career foreign service and ended up serving as our ambassador to Cyprus, which is a particularly fascinating uh, case study in 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 post trauma society. Uh, July twentieth of this year will mark fifty years since the Turkish troops moved into northern Cyprus and started expelling. Greek speaking Cypriots to the south end of the island. And in response, a lot of Turkish speaking Cypriots fled the southern side. And now we have a divided island and the UN patrolling uh, a society that's uh, on the surface functioning quite well, at least in the Cypriot, uh, the Greek Cypriot part. Uh, they're part of the EU. They're getting investment from all around the world, uh, a lot of tourism. But if you scratch the surface, everybody has a parent or a grandparent who somehow was affected by this trauma. And you know, thousands of people were killed. Some people are still unaccounted for. And what's interesting in Cyprus is while you will be told, well, I'm a refugee and or I'm the child or the grandchild of a refugee, they don't really talk about the emotions that come with that or how they dealt with the emotions and and, and they haven't dealt with the emotions they, they haven't done what the rwandans and the south africans have tried to do the good news is there are some efforts to help the cypriots learn from what's gone on in northern ireland uh, there are some exchanges with uh, youth groups that involves Palestinians and Israel, Israelis, young people, <laughs> mostly high school and college students coming together and, and talking about their emotions and how, how it feels to live in a society where everybody distrusts everybody. Um, and and I, I just think we could we could learn a lot from looking at uh, places where the the trauma has been in existence for decades and people mostly by waiting until the next generation comes along have have defined a different relationship uh, yesterday my wife after we went and saw the eclipse in cleveland we drove all the way across pennsylvania and went to wilmington delaware and she had been invited to talk to students at the biden center for policy and public administration she explained how diplomacy works, and she explained the, the 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 tension in Cyprus and why they haven't been able to get past it, why they haven't been able to erase the the uh, the green zone between the two communities, and it, it came down to fear. It came down to not being creative and bold enough to think about accepting the other, and it came down to the fact that. The people around the table trying to figure out the future of Cyprus were all 50 and 60 year old men. Women were not engaged. And most critically, as Kathleen said, there was nobody talking about the, the, what the young people thought. For the young people, it's not so immediate. They, they weren't traumatized. They inherited or the trauma, to, trauma was sort of passed down to them. It wasn't something they experienced. And, and some of them have gone to school with people from the other community. A lot of the Turkish-speaking Cypriots, at least the rich ones, send their kids across the green zone 
to English speaking schools in the southern part of Nicosia, but they weren't there. So you had all these people who were trying to define a better future for a United Cyprus, and they just held the animosity and the grudges. But they didn't, again, they didn't talk too publicly about their fears. They just, you know, they've couched everything in terms of what's fair and, you know, how we get reparations. It was all kind of an economic analysis rather than an emotional psychological analysis. And, and again, I'm talking too much and I think I've talked enough and I, I do apologize. I will have to sign off in about half an hour. Great comments. Thanks, Mike. Uh, there's a couple of people who have to drop off at the top of the hour. So thank you for being here for, for this part. Um, just a pause for a second. Um, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, wrote to Germany for reparations from Bolivia, where they ended up just before the war, and got a little bit of repayment. But I, the reason I know some of the family history that my family never actually told me out loud is that finally, years later, I received a stack of correspondence on onion skin paper of my mm -hmm. grandfather telling the story over and over again to different bureaucrats in Germany who were busy processing things through official means. And uh, uh, one of the pages includes, uh, as best he could remember, an inventory of the furniture they had to sell at nothing, no prices in Berlin in 39 to get out of town because he worked the bureaucracy to actually get out of town with proper permission. Uh, so I've got documents with, with swastika stamps on them that basically they're character witness documents. And there's one in particular that says you have 60 days to get out of Dodge, uh, basically. And, and then they left on two steamships. Um, and I've been trying to figure out personally uh, through a little bit of internal family systems and things like that, um, how that affects, how things that happened then that weren't talked about affect me uh, in my life. And I don't think I've actually cracked that code yet. Um, thanks, Mike, you still have your hand up. Um, uh, Patty, then Kevin, please. Um, I could use a breath. Could I invite everyone to take a breath? Please. Yeah. Hmm. So a couple of things I'm tracking, uh, maybe a bit of a, like a meta level of this conversation. I were tapping into question marks around how can we, uh, not that we have to restructure anything, but how could society begin to accommodate and account for all of the cost of the unprocessed and unintegrated trauma that exists intergenerationally um, at the uh, genetic level in our lived experience, what we inherited from grandparents who went through the Holocaust, right? I mean, I think that something that, that keeps coming up to me is that one of the core values, at least of the United States culture, efficiency seems to continue to be at odds with healing. And as long as efficiency is a high value, it's going to be really costly and challenging for larger systems to create the space or even create shared language to better understand what is truly needed at the community level to support, fo support folks who are on their own journey, whether they know it or not, of healing. So that was a thought. Um, I think per Jerry's question, why are we so mean to each other? I've been thinking a lot about the just um, it might not sound like it would be a big deal, but I think it's it's an enormous problem. What we're modeled in the media and what we're what we're modeled in TV shows around how to have hard conflict conversations. I was in a um, I'm in an embodied social justice program right now. And we had a module yesterday and there's a huge rupture, huge rupture in this two hour module. And we all had to kind of watch this facilitator handle this like very, very activated blowing up. And that question was passed around the space a lot. And I think it occurred to me that like, we don't really, we're not really shown how to do it differently. We're not really shown how to take breaths, slow down conversations, ask questions. And, and I think this, this draws really well into this, um, just to offer some shared language for the group um, at the, as I think, as long as we can just continue to keep trying to like solve the problem of trauma without having really clear shared language around what is happening at the biological level we're just gonna be running in circles, right? And so there's this, um, just to offer some shared language, there's this concept, I think it was Dan Siegel who um, created this back in the, I think it was the nineties, he calls it the window of tolerance and a lay person's way to, to understand this might be like our like ability, our little window of regulation before we, if something, we have some kind of outside stimulus that activates us and we get bumped out of our window of tolerance, we get reactive in the fight, flight or freeze. 
or other um, dysregulated responses. And like within the window of tolerance, this is where all of the good things that humanity can, can um, this is like the like the juice of where we can connect. We can sleep well when we're in our window of tolerance, when we're in um, consistent regulation. Like this is where the potential of humanity lies. But we also exist in a system that, whether it's intentional or not, is doing a fantastic job of continuing to shrink windows of tolerance and push us out of our window of tolerance. And so I think a system we have to name, we would do well to name, that the systems that we are a part of are culpable for continuing to um, take us further and further away from this potential and possibility we have of being regulated, connecting, and actually having effective um, problem solving. And so I think that's it's important for that to be named. And I would like to think that this the healing and the the reparation we're looking for will happen at the level of systems, but I've seen nothing yet to suggest that that's what's going to move the needle, at least where we're at right now. And so I think um, personally, having an experience where, there's a different story around the story of trauma. I think um, there's someone else on the, the call here. We've had a really good conversation about this, about how trauma in and of itself and really having these trauma-informed practices. I'm also a trauma-informed practitioner. So this is this is me speaking to my lineage of training, but there's, there's a deep issue here and that there's, a, I'll use their words, they call it a fetishization of the trauma, which can lead to us getting stuck in the pain, identifying with the pain, not really ready to release the pain. And in my lived experience, I have not yet seen an instance of someone being able to heal from victim consciousness. And so in my opinion, there has to be a paradigm shift or a collective shift where we have a different story about what hardship, um, the place that hardship has in our life. And as long as we continue to see our hardships from this place of like, oh, why is this happening to me? Like, well, you know, you know, and like from the victim orientation, that's going to continue to be a barrier to individual and collective healing. And I feel complete. Um, let's take another pause. I think, Patty, you just put many wonderful things into the conversation. One of the things you've made me think of is that it appears that in many places around the world right now, inducing trauma is being used as a political strategy, partly because it shuts down our window of tolerance and it makes us react in ways we don't really necessarily want to react. And so our ability to stay and keep that window of tolerance open or broaden it is in direct conflict with a bunch of people's efforts to shut us down and make us fear. There was an interesting article recently uh, with, that said, hey, things aren't as bad as we think they are. Hey, look, and it, it pointed out a bunch of different stats about where most Americans agree on this. And it was the, the article was particularly about whether the U.S. is actually bitterly, terribly divided or not. Uh, and it said, look, we're, we're actually not that divided. There, there's a bunch of people who want us to think that we're that divided and it's working. Um, so, so I think that there's a conscious use of trauma as a political instrument that we need to be very aware of that runs counter to what I think we would like humans to be able to do more of um, by themselves and together. So thank you. Um, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Patty. Um, in my own, I'll take my hand down, uh, healing, I've... Uh, been worked with folks who have used the methods uh, from the book, The Body Keeps Score, which is a really interesting kind of groundbreaking research. They looked at Vietnam vets and saw where the trauma was embedded and where, how the nerves deposited things. But in my work in economic justice, there's a really interesting further take on that called uh, My Grandmother's Hands. And it's uh, racialized trauma. And what I've found is that the, the best folks working best in terms of they, they help entrepreneurs get better, better, use uh, an analysis of uh, intergenerational trauma when they um, are seeing whether, what are the barriers to that entrepreneur? Because <clears throat> there are voices in their heads from their grandfathers, their grandmothers, or 
the people who talk to their grandmothers to say, you know, you shouldn't ask, you can't have, you can't own. Uh, and so you have, you have to deal with that because there are all the other things that work against you as an entrepreneur. Uh, and so you have to deal with, you know, they, they take intergenerational trauma as a, as a material thing to work with. <clears throat> and I think that's, uh, you know, you can work around it. Now, another thing I'm seeing just in, you know, I thought we agreed that we wouldn't be doing conversation in the chat. I'm going to ignore the chat and be in, in this space. And uh, I thought that was a norm. I, uh -huh. I sure believe that we should do it and not have conversations in chat that distract. I'm Kevin, a, I'm a vote to stop that. Kevin, the chat um, the chat uh, restriction is only during our check-in calls so that the check-in calls are more ah. present and mindful. So we're on a topic. Oh, okay, so we, we don't have to be present in the in this big issue. I get it. Okay, well, Th that's, that's fine. That's not what I'm trying to say, but we've made a choice but that it it's is okay what to is, share resources actually, here. It is what is happening. We are, we are distracted from this space by conversations in chat. Is that going to be allowed in every OGM or is it not allowed in check -in? Most of the chat is footnotes. It's people adding. A bunch of the chat is not footnotes. It is conversation. I see people responding to each other. I just want to know, is, is that a norm or not a norm? It's how it's it's current norm for OGM in our regular conversations. Anybody who's been here for many of these calls uh, is familiar with the rhythm. And I don't think there's anything unusual happening in today's chat that hasn't happened for four years uh, worth of OGM calls. Right, but I think we agreed a couple of weeks ago that chat was a distraction from the space we're in with each other. No, only for check-in calls, Kevin. We, we decided to make the calls different and to make the check-in calls special by eliminating the chat because it was a distraction. We did not make the decision collectively that we're all never going to have chat again, which is a decision I would object to. I, okay. I would suggest, um, I, I love this topic, by the way, the, um, a meta topic. Um, I don't know how what, long we should spend with it, but um, Kevin, I, I hear you and I, I kind of agree. Oh. Um, I myself am not distracted by the chat. I did not even know there were conversations going on. I think I've made one or two replies, but it's in footnote mode. I have not been distracted by the chat. So I think the fact that there is conversation going on in the chat means that some people may be conversing in the chat and maybe they're distracted from the space, but I think there's a bunch of the rest of us who aren't. Um, so I, th okay. I think maybe the thing to do is have it be a personal choice. You know, if you find the chat distracting, just close it. Um, don't pay attention to it. And uh, if you want to zone out from the room and, and get sucked into a di different conversation, you know, go for it. Um, okay, fine. I'm good with that too. Um, Stuart. I, I just want to say I feel strongly about that issue. And I'm frankly really torn because I find the chat invaluable and I feel like my attention is being torn and I am struggling as hard as I can to do all of the above. And I feel like if I didn't have the chat or the ability to chat, my brain would be hurting in ways that would also interfere with my ability to be, to be present. So I'm completely torn on the issue. Um, uh, I, I, I would note that footnotes, footnote kinds of things, thanks, that, thanks for that terminology, Mike, um, can go down on a personal notepad and at least bleed off some of the like stress of like, oh my God, I have a thing to, um, and I, I actually kind of would value uh, an agreement not to do chat, uh, at least on some calls. Um, maybe not all of them, but a call like this where we're we're trying to pay uh, group group attention to a topic, um, it makes sense that the chat, even though I love chat, you know, at the right time, maybe it's not the right context for it. So to redo this call, maybe we could have, you know, flipped the switch. You know, this is one where we could just close the chat and not do it. Um, I, I really hear Doug and Kevin um, and, and want to honor that. And, and it makes sense to me. Thank you. Let's say, let's say this issue is definitely not resolved and we can come back and figure out how we, what we, how we want to do going forward. Um, Stuart, please. Yeah. So um, there is a cost of conflict that often doesn't, um, surface is something that people measure and look at it all, but it's, it's there. Um, I certainly use it as motivation for people to stop 
<laughs> and get to the other side. It's, it's you know, a piece of economic justifications. It was really interesting to me to hear Patty talking about being exposed to um, what I'll call, for want of a better term, you know, uh, deep conversations. Um, so this motivated me to look at my bookshelf. Difficult conversations, crucial conversations, crucial confrontations, crucial accountability, getting to yes, getting past no, <laughs> getting together, and, and my book, Getting to Resolution, which was endorsed by Stephen Covey, among other, among others. Um, I share that in the sense of um, what pops up in my mind is the great statement that Al Gore used to make about, you know, dealing with climate. That, you know, we know what to do. We don't have the political will to do it. <laughs> and that that's the edge. That's the rub, I think. You know, um, I spent about 15 years doing a lot of divorce mediation work with the models that I had developed. And I had people, um, couples that were getting divorced, talk about traumatic context, um, really healing the relationship because of a process that I put them through. Um, and it was some of the most satisfying work I've ever, I've ever done. Um, it was the most amazing soulful work. So I think that we know what to do if we could, and I always had this vision to magnify that, you know, to do to do that work with 25 couples in a room going through a divorce. That was the vision that I had. So we, we, we know what to do. It's just a question of um we're not we're not doing it. We're not doing it. And it's the key, I think, for um moving into a future that's going to be different um, from the past. It's got something to do with the educational system. Um, i.e., I know in the 90s there was tons of money spent on child education about dealing with conflict. Um but that was one of the first fundings that was um, um, that was gotten rid of. So um, yeah, um, and each generation, as as Patty just demonstrated, comes to understand ah, there is a way to move forward, um, but we don't do it as a, as a mass cultural um, because I think politicians um, need to be tough. Um, I mean, that's what Netanyahu is doing right now. He's being a tough politician um, and he's creating um, chaos and trauma all around. Um, Shimon, I uh, feel you just took your hand down, I think by accident. Um, no, okay, good. Um, Shimon, then Patty. Uh, Shimon, uh, you're not muted on Zoom, but we're not hearing you. Nope. Uh, try unplugging your microphone. Try putting in an earbud. Uh, as soon as we hear your voice, we'll pass uh, pass you the voice. Uh, go ahead, Patty. In the meantime. Um, so per per Stuart share uh, something I've been thinking about recently and reflecting on is just really being present to how necessary connection is for human survival and thriving. And how we, this just goes back a little bit to what I was sharing earlier. We haven't, we still haven't been modeled healthy ways of connecting. And so connecting is going to uh, largely that that's, you know, that's a generalization. That's not true for everyone, of course, but for the most part, we haven't seen or been modeled how to relate healthily to one another, how to have realistic and um, I'll just leave it at realistic expectations of what relationship can and cannot provide us. And there still isn't a conversation I'm hearing held widely about the power of being able to like meet our own emotional needs and not continuing to project them out to others while still being in connection with others and having and practicing interdependence. So there's an element there. So I think that so much harm is done and continues to be done relationally um, and trauma perpetuated relationally because those two pieces aren't yet um, being talked about or clear or we have shared language around, so that's one. And then two, something I think about often is um, just, I refer to it as the cycle of pain, right? So um, I think, I don't remember who was presencing it earlier, but there was, it might've been Gil um, suggesting that, or no, it was Ken, there's the post-traumatic stress response and then the post-traumatic growth response. 
And I think that um, the framework that we have to work within this is still not, you know, widely talked about. It's not um, dinner time, how they say dinner time talk, conversation, household, like household language. Um, and I think that in my lived experience, what I continue to observe is if um, it's the cycle of pain is if harm occurs, um, we either have the option or we don't know we have an option to process in a way that is like, um, let's say like regenerative or at least neutral, or we don't process it, we kind of pack it away and save it for later. If we opt for the latter, it becomes um, something living in our body that we inevitably uh, harm ourselves, right? Varying different degrees of um, harm that can occur at that level. We harm others, we, we ventilate that charge, that unprocessed and held charge in the body onto other humans, we harm other humans, we perpetuate trauma in that way. And we also harm the planet, we also harm other life, we overconsume. And so it's my belief that the, the greatest threat to life on this planet, both human and all other life, is unprocessed emotional garbage we've been holding for generations and generations, don't have permission or language or frameworks to help us process and deal with that. And I can't help but feel we're kind of at a time right now where like all of that stuff that we've saved for later over generations and generations, it's just coming to a head now. It's not coming to a head now, but the planet can't sustain it anymore. And so to finish, my belief is that our collective greatest threat is the weight of our unprocessed emotional pain. And again, I just, I can't help but feel like one of the most urgent needs in this space as we figure out how to navigate through this and forward together is having a different story around why it's happening and that it, how can we create a new narrative where we see this as an opportunity to grow and to heal and for each of us to have better and more fulfilled and um, happier lives, better relationships on the other side of it, where it's something we're doing for ourselves, but we're also doing it for the collective. I feel complete. Oh, uh, get Patty, who's we? Um, Gil, can you remind me where I said we? You, you said we a lot. And I'm just remembering the, the Ken Homer question of which we of we are you referring to when you say we? Are you talking about humanity in general, everywhere? Um, um, you know, owners, older, younger, traumatized, not traumatized. I don't, I don't mean to hassle you about it, but it's just you're using it very generally. And I want to get a sense of how universal your statements feel to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's important clarification. I appreciate you reflecting that. Um, I think most of the time I, I tend to use that in this context, we just gen as a very much a generalization of the collective. So I don't think that it, it necessarily includes a single user group of any or cohort of any that you just suggested. It's just kind of the, I think it was you said earlier, is this the human condition? I think this is um, what we're talking about is an innate experience in the human experience, but we just need a different way to- okay. Can I just one thing to that then? Please very briefly, I just class, I'm sorry to jump the line. I'm really struck as I reflect on this conversation about uh, people who have lived through the same, what appears to be the same traumatic experience and come out very differently with a very different lived experience and orientation to what they went through. And that, uh, to me, uh, that's it, it, it's an invitation to look into that and understand what, what's going on there. I know, I know Holocaust survivors who are, you know, shut down for their lives and never talk about it. And I, and I know one's one who just died last month at 102, uh, who lived in it uh, in a, in a, uh, how to say this, with the pain still alive, but his life also still alive. Um, and so, you know, the range, the range of human response to trauma is, is, as I, as I think something worthy to look at also. Can I, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, Shimon, I was going to go to you and I'm glad you're in with your phone now. So go for it. Well, I'm on my iPhone now where before I was on my laptop. First of all, it's nice to be back. I think last time I was connected with the group was on discussing Gaza in uh, probably in October. I actually have quite a lot of experience academically, clinically, less personally with trauma. I actually was just at the psychedelic conference in Denver where a lot of the conversation was about epigenetics and intergenerational trauma. I think when we talk about trauma, there are just so many different levels of trauma. And for what Gil said, I'm glad that I waited or I couldn't speak before because of, you know, like the technical stuff. The area that really fascinates me is exactly what Gil spoke about. And actually, 
one of my mentors in medical school in Israel was the person who came up with the theory called salutogenesis. I've mentioned that before, which tries to understand exactly that. Why do some people thrive? Because there is the concept now of post-traumatic flourishing, and why do some people languish? And he came up with the idea, which I totally agree with, and actually developing the idea of a sense of coherence. If we have a sense of coherence, then it helps us really cope a lot better. It does not mean that it's something good. Ultra-religious people have that. People with you know very strong ideology have it. Uh, one of the problems for people in liberal societies is they don't really have such a strong sense of coherence and are much vul more vulnerable not to respond well. My concern right now, and again, as I said, I mean, I've worked on so many different levels with trauma. My concern is how to avoid that. To your point, Jerry, how to deal with it moving forward. My biggest fear, or one of my biggest fears, is the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have on society in general, and certainly on the work environment. I've studied very deeply the issue of the opiate epidemic, and I know people mentioned here, you know, like training and all that stuff. Most of the treatments for opiate dependence, however you want to call it, uh, really are not very helpful. My sense is we need to really deal with, and I think someone mentioned that, how do you deal it with early in life? Not necessarily just giving people tools of how to cope better, but even before that, how to understand the biology, the environmental factors, and also the social system, the capitalism and other systems that actually put us in a position where at some point we're probably gonna be very affected by changes. The opiate epidemic, yeah, there was the Sacklers, but much of it was because of what would happen with globalism, neoliberalism, and essentially the demise of communities. And I think that there is an easy way of not looking at these kind of things by focusing on, well, it's because of you know the FDA or the DEA, but unless we really understand what gives people purpose and meaning and what happens when they lose it, I think we're gonna get into more and more difficulties. There are quite a lot of people in the AI field who are very concerned, not the existential threat of AIs, you know, turning us all into paper clips, but what's gonna happen when people lose their purpose because our purpose is so defined by work and efficiency like people mentioned. But what happens then, what's gonna happen then, which has happened throughout history, is people look for purpose and meaning. And oftentimes a strong leader like a Hitler, people like that come about and provide the answers. My project right now is exactly dealing with not necessarily strong leaders, but really starting preconception, how to really understand and how to build a society that helps people flourish. And I think that's what we really need to think about is how to think from the beginning on, like preconception, looking at communities, things of that kind. One of the things that I'm very encouraged by is the whole chat GPT. I know I sort of like introduced or talked about it a lot probably a year ago. I even worked on a program, me and Chad GPT, to change the political dynamics in Israel. But recently there's a lot of amazing work done by people looking at how to co-write, how to co-think, how to co-do almost anything with three of the new models, GPT, Claude, and also Gemini. And I think I think you as a group, we as a group, that would be really a great avenue to look at how to kind of co-create thinking in generative kind of problem solving. And I think we really have tools now that even a year ago we didn't have. And I think the urgency of you know understanding what happens to people when they lose purpose and meaning and the very likely trajectory we're headed in, I think makes it almost imperative 
to really look in that direction. Um, I feel we need to take another beat, but I want to ask you just for a moment. Uh, Pete tried to expand. Uh, Pete did a lovely job expanding on your notion of the sense of coherence in the chat. But could you talk a little bit more about coherence? And then I'd love to go quiet for another little bit. Well, you know, you have to, I mean, people talk about human nature. I mean, my sense, Jerry, is not that why do we have so much violence? My question is why do we have so little violence? Because, you know, essentially we're programmed in this driving force in my kind of thinking about these things. And as a psychiatrist is Cain and Abel, you know, uh, Cain for whatever reason, and we think it's, you know, jealousy or envy or frustration or betrayal, kill, killed his brother. And essentially the same neurocircuitry that existed then still exists right now. We develop in societies, you know, mechanisms through culture, religion, education, language to dampen that. We were able to create the enlightenment where rational thinking, you know, comes into play and helps us overcome those urges, not even going into psychoanalytic theory in this regard. What's happening now globally is that people are getting coherence from tying themselves back to very fundamentalist religious beliefs, which sort of like throws away everything that's been accomplished over the last 200 years in Western civilization. So what is the sense of coherence? You know, our brains and we try to make sense of the world. You know, our anxiety is the difference between what we understand the world to be and what we experience in the world. Why do we experience trauma? We experience it because we go along, we expect things to be a certain way, and then all of a sudden they're not. So how do we cope with that? Oftentimes it causes anxiety in my realm, field. For some people, they get catatonic, people get psychotic, people get, you know, there's a whole range. And again, it depends on what stage of life you're exposed to it. So a sense of coherence essentially is a really wonderful operating system that evolution has allowed us to do that we don't have to continuously reevaluate and re establish our program of how we make sense of the world. That's why families play such an important role. That's why communities, religions, everything, it just sort of like gives us a kind of a continuum. And within that continuum, a certain broadband we're functioning within. What happens when you have a good sense of coherence, you shut everything else out. So like in the Arab Israeli or, you know, I, I, I prefer calling it like, well, Israeli Hamas or however one of you define it. I mean, those people on the Israeli side who are religious fundamentalists have an incredible sense of coherence. I mean, they have a whole well-organized, and we used to talk about that with people with psychosis. It's a well-organized psychotic structure. It makes sense for these people. It helps them function. If it means that they're going to kill someone for maintaining that sense of coherence, that's a small price to pay. On the other side, with Hamas, they have the same thing. The religious fundamentalism that they are engaged in ties into liberating all of Palestine and killing anyone who's in the way. So they have a very strong sense of coherence. Now, with sense of coherence, if you're interested, I mean, I have the whole, you know, my, my work is built on creating paradigms that help us, re, you know, shift our way of looking, to, uh, uh, looking at what we're going through. But a sense of coherence is built on your sense of manageability, whether you feel you're manage able to manage your environment, whether you're capable of it, and whether you know people will respond to it. So it has three components. We're doing a project with a number of people on coherence in the workplace. Why do people so often have 
burnout in the workplace. So we're looking at using that model. But I think coherence, and again, back to Gil's point about why people function one way or another confronted with the, the same, seemingly the same trauma, I think this is a good explanatory model, the whole salutogenic model. Jimon, thank you very much. Let's uh, go into silence for a little bit. I'll bring us back out in a moment. Boss, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shaman. That was uh, that was helpful. Um, in in many ways, this is really a watershed moment, isn't it? Um, I mean, this this um, this is deep and impactful, and uh, um, it hits us pretty hard. Um, in our established worldviews um, and uproots a lot of things that uh, um, we we have come to believe. So I I take you know my my German uh, culture background here. Um, you know Germany after the war was uh, what I would call radically pacifist. You now pacifist to the point of. Uh, being radical about it. So the German military was a joke. I mean, I spent two years in the German military and it was ridiculous. Um, and, and the Germans really thought that um, the world ought to be a rational place. And, and if you provide uh, uh, physical well-being and in and, and a place of economic security, then things will just fall in place. Um, and then you come to the question, why does this Jewish uh, 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 action and reaction create such attention when there were you know, literally a dozen such cases around the world um, where people, a, a tribe got displaced? I mean, uh, think of the Orinjas and, and think about Sudan and, and other places. and it never really triggered this kind of um, emotional response uh, on a global level. Um, so what place do the Jewish people have in our psyche that, uh, that makes this stand out and, and, uh, and uh, be so, so uh, very different and observed? And then when you when you drill that down, I mean, it's really here you have one of the most sophisticated advanced tribes resort to medieval brutality and and uh, uh, go back into into uh, a uh, uh, acts of uh, of hor horrible violence um, and then then you think that um, uh, wow you know that's really that's really who we collective species are and we may not be able to get through it so in Germany right now, that's a really big turning point. I mean, the Germans are going back to rearming themselves. They're saying, you know, to hell with this deal. Um, we have to be militarily strong. Japan is doing the same. So this this whole experiment of liberal, uh, of uh, building a liberal, uh, uh, free thinking society uh, has failed. Now it doesn't work in this world that we are in. Um, well, it has failed, Cherry. I don't know what uh, what makes you think. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure it's totally failed. I mean, that's a that's a blanket declaration. I think it's struggling. That's for sure. I don't know that it's failed, but but I'm just an optimist that way. Yeah, well, it has failed in the sense that um, 
it uh, it needs to be restructured to also convey strength. Yeah. If you if you the the idea for Germany, for example, to not have a military that's like worth anything, and and uh, um, and to be basically militarily, martially defenseless, uh, uh, doesn't work. You have to you liberal. Uh, society has to be also uh, combined with strength and the capacity to project strength uh, in, in order to function. That's sort of where you know, the German psyche uh, has come to at this point. Um, so that's why you know they're just pouring billions of dollars into the military right now. And there is really an emotional sense of we got to get back you know, on track here because we are at risk. And so that's 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 uh, a turning point here, which I don't think we 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 haven't we have quite processed yet. Um, but it's it's also I don't know. I mean, it's probably a sense of reality. You know, if that's who we are as a species, then let's really deal with that and and build a frame. And hopefully, AI may uh, assist. You know, in pointing in pointing towards social structures. Uh, and 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 physical realities that that help us build you know, a society that can actually uh, uh, prevail and and bring leadership to the front that is actually uh, uh, leading us into into a better place. Right? Thank you, Klaus. Um, Doug, uh, Doug C. I think one thing that's not being mentioned is economic trauma. We all live on the edge of the trauma of losing our income, whether it's loss of jobs, collapse of a company uh, in government, uh, that our agency doesn't get uh, refunded. Uh, if you're rich and have a portfolio, there's the fear about the for portfolio collapsing. Uh, I think that economic insecurity is just so pervasive. Uh, and it's it's not just insecurity, uh, like falling off of uh, some simple thing. It's the, the loss of one's livelihood and the definition of who we are in society. And we're all there. I noticed, by the way, that I work hard to make my interventions here short. And I'm not sure if that's effective. Um, thanks, Doug. Carl? Uh, there we go. Places with um, Doug, because I've been waiting, but um, yeah, sometimes we also have the thing where three people have spoken three times before others get a chance to and things. But I posted a lot of things in the link in case I wasn't here to say, but I'd like to uh, I'll defer to after Doug. I think Carl just passed to you, Doug B, but I'm not sure. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, so so I'd like to offer a, a slightly different orientation <laughs> and perspective, picking up on on um, Shimon's contribution. Um. On a really fundamental level, um, feelings trump thoughts every time. And as living biological beings, um, feelings sort of determine response the person having the feelings and their relationship to them 
on an identity level, self-awareness level, consciousness level. Um, directly factors into that thing about why given the same trauma to two different people come out of it completely different. And the reason for the difference for the person who goes through the most horrendous stuff and ends up um, paralyzed versus the person who goes through the exact same experience and comes out whole, intact, dusting themselves off and taking inventory of whatever they have left and going about maximizing their lives, their generate, generative potential, their, their um, levels of connection and engagement with the world around them, um, is actually rooted in where they center their source of orientation. So if that orientation, if they're, and here I'm gonna invoke a little elemental stuff, but as, hopefully as little as possible, their sense of their own earth, their own grounding, their own knowing and awareness of who they are on a being level, felt sense across all five bodies, the more that is internal and de facto, the more resilient and effective they are going to be in the face of whatever. Now, sort of zooming out, natural world, natural law says that everything's connected to everything. Everything affects everything. It's an ongoing standing living principle of connection all the time, everywhere, always. Everything about our culture, Western civilization, and the uh, primacy of intellect, of ideas, and, and Shimon, I'm going to reference your, your, your invocation of coherence, um, is actually rooted not in a concept of connection. It's rooted in a concept of disconnection, discrimination, separating and sorting, itemizing, ontologically parsing and breaking down. Science is rooted in proving something and fixing an idea and then validating that once fixed, it'll fix again and again and again until somebody else comes along and bumps it out of the saddle into a new thing to be fixed in place. What's psychotic at the root of that is that in the face of natural law, everything is constantly changing. Everything is constantly in motion. Nothing ever repeats. In fact, that fixation, that breaking things down, that parsing and separating, disconnecting one thing from other things, one group of people from another group of people, intrinsically is seeking to fix things in place, to not have anything in motion, to provide predictability, to provide repetition, to provide same, 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 same. It is literally in 180 80 degree opposition to natural reality and law. It doesn't make sense, but that is the whole endeavor of every aspect of our current culture, civilization, education, productivity, everything. How to replicate, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. And the sense of earth, the sense of grounding and identity isn't rooted in the individual living being. It's rooted, it's transposed and externalized to nouns, to things, to patterns, to systems, to science, to all of these things 
that are intellectual constructions because we can. But the underlying fundamental result of that is disconnection, atomization, and fragmentation, and fixation in place. The goal and greatest aspiration is for something to never change. I can generate the same sales next quarter as I did this quarter, as I did two quarters back and five quarters. And the tension of being a living being, in fact, connected to everything in the natural world, embodying everything changing, everything being in motion, everything flowing as part of an energetic field up against that is driving everybody crazy, has us killing each other, has us doing insanely irrational things because it's irreconcilable. So, Coherence is still stuck in the mental, it's stuck in the intellectual, it's stuck in the abstract, it's stuck in the, we are going to construct our way out of this. We're going to rationally figure out our way out of this. And the truth of the matter is, emotions trump thoughts, feelings trump thoughts. And fear is fear, and safety is safety. And unless somebody can be provided with safety, there is no way for them to heal or change or feel into wholeness again. And the system, last but not least, and I apologize for the length of this, but the system we're in is training everybody to seek their earth, their center of orientation, their grounding and things external to them. Because if I can provide that and sell you that, I make money. Again, reflection of the same thing. And so the point made about why people turn to authoritarians, because there, there, there's no means or safety for them to even begin to look internally for their sense of security, grounding, and orientation. And I apologize for the length of that. And I also apologize for like having to flee immediately on the heels of it. But I, I thank you all for being here and having this conversation. It's important. Thanks, Doc, a lot. <clears throat> um, Pearl, I think earlier you passed the mic um, to Doug, but your hand is still up, so I wanted to offer you the floor if you'd like to step back in. Okay, yeah, thanks. I had, um, I had uh, somebody come in to do some work on that, so let them in. Oh, there's so many, <laughs> so many things with this. I did post quite a few links. I just wanted to kind of bring them to um, people's attention. Um, that Ra Rachel Yehuda, she had an interview with, um, well, that Chris, um, Chris, the type of the, the on being that's a, talks about trauma and resilience across um, generations, which be, there's also Peter Gables. Um, he had his last, I guess, I think it was his um, final book was on the desire for mutual recognition. And that link um, is actually, he was a, uh, editor at Tikkun, and that's, um, uh, there's a lot of things there, obviously, around the, I mean, that's the um, progressive end of the, of the Jewish uh, perspective um, type of thing. I, um, one of my key mentors has been um, Paul Costello. He's done a lot of work about the new story and it's all about storytelling, and he's actually um, brought um, Israeli and Palestinian, um, mostly college students, over to D.C. to intern on the Hill and other other um, places and stuff. So um, he's got a lot of things. And um, Donna Hicks um, actually worked with Desmond Tutu and the, the, the whole idea of dignity. So how do we get... <laughs> 
dignity, trauma, resilience, story. It's all kind of um, part of the mix. So I guess that my, yeah, Doug B and I have obviously, we have a lot of <laughs> interesting conversations and things. Um, we really can't comp, we're just, we cannot comprehend, truly comprehend a, a, a open system. So we, um, so we get into closed systems, but there's always adding, there's a, for everything you know, there's one thing you don't, and that doubles the number of, that previously unknown thing has a relationship with everything you know. And so, I mean, that's the Pascal's triangle. It's like add one more component to your system and it doubles the number of relationships, two to the end. Not, and then minus one, but people act like, oh, that's insignificant as n gets larger. It's like, no, that one is the container for everything else and things. So just from that, that standpoint. Um, so yeah, it's, um, and then like, well, the time sensitive thing too that I wanted to bring to people's attention is the Brain 14 is, um, uh, officially was released a couple weeks ago and, and um, the de primary de developer there, Harlan Hugh, um, he's going to actually be talking about it at 2 p.m. Eastern here. So I put a link for people to register if you're, if you're interested. Thanks, Carl. We're getting close to the end of our time to, for today, but uh, Gil and Hank. Let me just take a moment. Thanks. So I was very affected by Doug B's rant. Uh, and I'm sorry that he had to leave. So I couldn't tell him that directly. Um, but um, it was very profound for me in part because it put into words um, experiences that I've been sort of moving through and hadn't put into words in that way. Um, so I felt um, a great appreciation for that. Um, um, and I, the, the, the connection between the urge to fix in the sense of repair, make better, make okay, and the urge to fix in the sense of lock it in place. Uh, it was a very powerful uh, resonance for me. The, the, you know, the urge to categorize uh, in the face of natural law where everything is changing. Uh, and I've been thinking for some time about uh, uh, our, our at least Western humans, addiction to classification. But this is this and not that. That is this and not that. There are boundaries, there's boxes, everything has a box to fit into. Uh, it even shows up in our conversation and our listening because um, often listening is listening for mapping what you say onto coherence that I already have different than listening with a complete openness to what might emerge in the conversation. And I've been working to train myself to at least notice that. Uh, am I listening to say, yes, I agree or disagree, or am I listening to be provoked into something new? It's very challenging and very interesting what opens with that. Um, um, Doug talked about where the boundaries are imposed. And I think of Nora Bateson's wonderful provocation of where does the deer end and the meadow begin? Uh, and we're in a world that's not only in constant flux, but where the boundaries are always, uh, you know, contextual and arbitrary um, and um, not discreet. You know, where do, in this conversation, are my thoughts, my thoughts or our thoughts? Where do they arise from? It's, you know, it's a very, it's a much messier universe than we seem to live in. And so, um, you know, the goal he spoke about of predictability um, um Sorry, words are difficult here. Um, that's one way to orient in the world, and another way is to orient in in some kind of respect of the of the of emergence in the face of utter contingency. Uh, you know, we don't. We, it, it, this has probably always been true of the world, but it feels very much so now that we don't know where things are going. We have no way of knowing. You know, I'm I'm a futurist who's given up prediction because it feels like a fool's errand at this point. And so how do we live in that kind of, you know, how do we walk on the shifting sands? How do we manage ourselves in the face of, of what, you know, what Flores would call utter contingency? 
um, which is not necessarily a bad thing because there's there are moves open in every moment about how to respond. Um, the, the, the one thing I disagreed with about what Doug said, and I was surprised that he said it, toward the end he said, fear is fear and safety is safety, which seemed like exactly the kind of thing he was decrying at the start. Uh, and we know from the physiologists that, uh, and somebody will probably have the reference for this or tell me that I'm wrong on, is that physiologically, uh, fear and excitement show up the same in the body. Um, so is fear, fear? Or is there possibilities of learned and conditioned responses where people can experience the same event and experience it as trauma or thrilling, as damaging or enriching? So I've spoken. Um. Thanks, Gil. Uh, I noticed we had Hank and Pete in the queue and we're sort of running out of time. I'd be very happy to hear Hank and Pete go ahead and then whoever wants to stay, I think we might have a queue of three poems right into the room uh, and it'll just spill over and that's cool. So uh, Hank, please. I'll try, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, I'm not familiar with most of the references and, and therapies which have been talked about earlier in the call. Uh, I made notes of them and I'll try to, to look at them. Uh, the few that I know, uh, such as uh, EMDR uh, and uh, family constitutions, uh, constellations, are very effective with individuals and small groups. So let me just ask a very naive question. Uh, are any of the, the therapies which have been talked about uh, usable for larger communities, uh, for, for parliaments, for congresses, for cabinets, uh, for so people in so-called nations who have this uh, memory of collective uh, trauma in their consciousness and in their bodies. And if there are, are there some which won't have the danger of uh, uh, descending into a kind of brave new world model. Uh, that's what I wanted to ask. That's a great question, Hank, and probably could be the subject of an entire call. Um, anybody have a quick answer on society scale therapeutic interventions? I do. Joanna Macy's, Joanna Macy's, the work that reconnects. Um, I've experienced this in groups as large as 100 people. Um, Several of the exercises <clears throat> can produce profound shifts in the space of about three hours and leave people with a sense of uh, hope and possibility. Thanks. Very interesting. Thanks, Ken. Um, Pete? Uh, I'll try to be short and uh, maybe I can turn my notes, uh, the, what I was going to say into an email. Um, I, I I really appreciate, especially hearing from Patty and and Shimon. Both of them really added to the to my understanding of the conversation and the the subject. Um, I wanted to kind of mention looking at, at instead of looking from the individual up, uh, looking at from the population level down, the species level down. Uh, one of the things I got shortchanged by in my education and all of our educations at the time when I was learning stuff was that natural selection works on individuals. Um, especially for social animals like people, um, there's a thing called group selection, which I think is still um, is still not really believed in all the way. But but anyway, it makes sense to me that um, any individual in a, in a species, especially a social species, is actually not really relevant to the survival of the species. It's how the all the individuals work together. So, um, so it's really fascinating to me to think about trauma and, you know, we could have evolved so that trauma didn't ring through like whole societies and, and, and multi-generations, right? We could have had that kind of thing. Um, so then it makes me wonder why is trauma a evolutionarily selected, uh, you know, generational trauma, especially or civiliz civilizational trauma? Why is that evolutionarily selected for? 
um, and I won't go into it now, but I'll try to get it into an email. Um, but but when you think, you know, uh, so so then group selection, super scale social structures, I think is also interesting. For me, um, a lot of the forces that we live in are inside these big um, monster things uh, that are, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of people large over centuries. And, and so then those forces also uh, compete in natural selection. Another one for me is that we've gone through, I don't know, a thousand years of warlike conquest oriented cultures, literally removing more peaceful cultures from our gene pool. So we are the sons and daughters of the warriors and the con con uh, conquerors. We're not the sons and daughters of the, the people who lost uh, those battles to the, the conquerors. So when we say, why are people mean and cruel to each other? It's like, well, that's what we've inherited from our, you know, our wars. Uh, uh, everybody else died. Uh, the, the people who weren't mean and cruel died. Um, why do people have very different reactions to trauma? This, to me, is a, a group selection thing, right? Uh, it makes sense that you'd want to have a variety of uh, reactions to trauma, and some of them are, you know, uh, selected for, some of them aren't, but you actually want that variety uh, as a, a means of testing different, different, uh, uh, different reactions. And so uh, civilizational trauma and generational trauma, it could be positive, in the sense that it, it creates more success for the people who carry it, um, carry the genes to, to, to be able to transmit it. Um, it can do things like uh, uh, trauma and then a reaction to it, good reaction to it, which may be, and by good there, I mean um, uh, survival of the species, not good for any individual. It's actually really traumatic for individuals, right? But um, societies, cultures that, that do well might be more adaptable and more resilient to future traumas. Um, they might be, they might get good at telling stories to meet future challenges. Uh, they might develop selective memories that, you know, uh, that sharpen different kinds of trauma so that, you know, they, they fight better or they win better or something like that. Um, so, uh, and I think also, uh, trauma is the the dark side of uh, cohesion and identity formation. So there's uh, there's a kind of a, a cycle there where um, we get more cohesive as a social unit uh, when we collectively experience like, trauma together, right? So um, just some thoughts. Thanks, um, Pete. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm I'm glad we made room for these things. I want to make a tiny a tiny note before go to three poems. Um, and I just added trauma as an unfortunate asset to the chat, which is the note, uh, something I want to add to the comments before my little note. And that is uh, people who have suffered loss um, sometimes figure out that that loss is actually a superpower for them. And it allows them to connect to other people. It gives them empathy. It gives them credibility. It opens connections. And if they can share and be vulnerable about their trauma, that is an okay thing. And to get there, they have to get past the shame associated with trauma. And we've stigmatized trauma in so many ways that revealing your trauma is a bad thing and it's going to be dangerous and it creates a moment of unsafety, which actually makes sharing trauma a, a bigger act of vulnerability and sharing and, and connection. So I think that Patty's question in the chat about how, how my trauma be a, a positive influence or a, a way, a path to, to positive change, I, I think flows along those kinds of ideas. Uh, the thing I want to leave with everybody is I've loved this call. I love that you all are here. Um, I want to know, do you want to go back to this topic in two weeks? Do we want to go to this topic for a couple weeks running so we don't lose the momentum and skip our check-in routine? Do we want to do something different? Uh, will we get tired of trauma? Will we exhaust ourselves on this and beat ourselves on the rock of trauma? Uh, but I think we've left a lot of really lovely paths in the conversation here. Uh, open questions about, you know, society scale uh, interventions about uh, can trauma be helpful, et cetera. So um, I would love to talk about this either on the Mattermost channel, the Town Hall, Town Square channel, or on the OGM list. Please just put your feedback about this call in there. Gil, go ahead. 
just a quick note we've been talking about trauma but not only we've been talking about humans and change and social change and all the things that we always talk about through this particular lens <laughs> everything we've talked about is applicable across our subject range agreed um so thank you and with that i will go to uh, we'll do ken me and patty for um poetry and if you must leave you must leave but thank you for for being here uh, the floor is yours ken So one thing I've noticed on this call is that we've talked about trauma in the abstract sense of those people over there. No one has spoken of personal trauma here today. And I'm going to, well, okay. It hasn't been a, a, a very uh, well-tapped vein, but I'm going to speak about that right now. This is a poem inspired by Sharon Olds. And for Sharon, for those of you who don't know Sharon Olds, she um, sort of, broke new ground by uh, writing poems about the abuse she suffered at the hands of her parents. Buried among my childhood memories in a deep underground reservoir of pain are events I'd rather forget, but their persistence is, su is such that the passing decades have failed to erase them. Here's one. My head and face are being held under the hot water faucet. My mother is roughly shoving a bar of dial soap into my four-year-old mouth. I'll never forget how its acrid taste made me gag. Why? I had innocently repeated a word I heard an adult utter the day before. It was a harsh way for me to learn that adults are free to say things that children are forbidden to speak. Had I but known, I would have kept my mouth shut. At that time, the word's, definitions were, the word's definition was well beyond my ken. I caught holy hell for speaking that word. It was years before I learned its meaning. To this day, I have absolutely zero recollection of what that word was. There is also a vast repository of slaps, a raft of rude insults to my tender flesh. How often did my sacred child's body end up cowering under the assaults that regularly rained down upon my head, my shoulders, my back, and of course, my face? Most were delivered by hand, some with a hairbrush. I sometimes wonder what her made her slap me so often. Was I such a horrid child? And why did I keep hearing her admonishment, stop your crying now or I'll give you something to really cry about? That boggled my mind and terrified me. Wasn't the last slap reason enough? I hadn't been crying before it landed. Would hitting me again teach me lessons the previous slaps had failed to impart? What were her slaps supposed to teach? And since I, get, I seem to get slapped constantly for new and unknown reasons, how was I supposed to learn at all? There were no rules. It was confusing as hell. I have questions about my mom's behavior. Questions whose answer I'll never know. And I wonder why more than 60 years later, am I still trying to understand? Why are these old memories still so fresh? There was a woman I used to work with. One day she couldn't get something to work on her computer. But I was, when I sat down and tried it, everything was just fine. Surprised and chagrined, she slapped me hard on the top of my head. Before I knew it, I had risen over her, my fists clenched with rage. Darkly, I thundered, don't ever hit me again. Do you understand me? Her eyes grew wide. I could see she was as shocked by my response to her slapping my head as I had been triggered by it. Why not? That was a question I didn't expect. Did I really need to explain to a woman 15 years my senior why hitting me in the head was inappropriate? Seriously. Looking back now, I'm sure my mother believed that hitting me so often was the right thing to do to help me grow. She'd been acting as she'd been taught. She was brought up in strict Lutheran and Germanic traditions. Traditions where punishment swiftly administered would prevent problems later on. Emotional costs both immediate and deferred, held no place in her parental accounting system. To this day, I wonder, did all her punishment and all her slaps make me a better person? That's a difficult question for me to answer. I only know that the rod was not spared, so the child was spoiled in a different way. <laughs> Thank you.
Ken, thank you. That's really beautiful and moving. Um, the poem I wanted to read into the room doesn't fit well after that, so I'm just going to share a link to it. Anybody can read it if you want to. Um, and I'll ask for just another little moment of silence, and then Patty, if you'd like to read your poem. But Ken, thank you. I don't think I'd ever heard that poem. I know Sharon Olds. I know a bunch of her poems, but... Um, that's my poem. Oh. I'm the person in that poem who was slapped and hit and... Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate the silence on the whole thing. How do you, if you like? Thank you, Jerry. And Ken, thank you for bringing your heart and sharing your heart with us. Your experience. Um, I would also like to pass on my share. Um, I will email it to uh, Pete to be written into the Plex. And if you'd like, you can read it there. Thank you. Thank you all.
I'm happy to see we outlasted Gil's Fathom note taker. <laughs> Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ken. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for holding the space, Jerry. See you next Thanks. time. Thanks for creating the space. That was great. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize this shirt has moiré effects on camera. I must stop wearing it. Groovy. Take care. Thanks. Bye.